The gospel today is found in Matthew chapter 4, hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And chapter 6, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Please be with our pastor today as he tells us your vision for us through these words that his message may touch each one of us in a way that is pleasing to you, that his words bring you glory and honor, and that we may leave this place a little better than we came in. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Judith. I should mention, uh, I've forgotten to put in the announcements that, you know, Crystal and I were gone because there was a national gathering of our denomination, Eco Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians, and it was beautiful. It was in this big church in a wealthy suburb of Dallas, this beautiful cathedral style sanctuary, and there were a couple thousand eager worshipers and participants there. It's a little tense, you know, some people wearing masks and some people not wearing masks and people being afraid. But when we worshiped, there's just such a ardent spirit of desire for God and wonderful speakers and excellent teaching. And so, uh, the, the heart of the denomination is just beautiful. I really find it hard to imagine um, something that I could like more. <laughs> I, I'm not a big institution guy either. So to have it win me over is, is a good thing. Uh, and I should behave myself and, you know, like my institution, and I do. So just wanted to give you that report. But I'll give you another report. I'll give you a report of Christmas about 20 years ago in Bend, Oregon, at my parents' house, and my sister and my nephews were there. And my younger nephew got a basketball hoop for Christmas. The kind where you put sand in the base and put the poles together and put the backboard up and shazam, you got a breakaway rim right there in the driveway. About a week after Christmas, several days after Christmas, my life, nearly lifelong friend, high school buddy came by because he lives in my hometown and we were going to spend some time together. And he looked on the side of the driveway and saw this disassembled basketball hoop. And he looked at me with shock and a little bit of disgust in his face and he said, what, what is that? Oh, I said, oh, that's my nephew's Christmas present. He got a basketball hoop. He said, why isn't it set up? I thought, oh, well, uh, I don't know. I guess I didn't know it was important. You see, this friend of mine is six foot eight, and he plays a lot of basketball. And he's thinking about what it's like to be a 10-year-old kid and not have your basketball hoop set up. And I was just immediately filled with this remorse and shame that was so wonderful that I'm sharing with you today. So, you know, you know why I'm saying that? Because... Prayer is the basketball hoop for us many, many times. We think, oh, yeah, that's a wonderful gift. I'll get right to that, and we'll get to it later. I'll pray Wednesday. I'll pray Thursday. I'll pray in the afternoon. Today I'm going to make a case from the Scripture. This is going to sound maybe legalistic, maybe annoying, but I'm going to make a case from the Scripture that the best practice for any Christian is to pray first thing in the morning six days a week. Mm. And I get all that from the scriptures that we just read, plus referring to uh, the book of Exodus. Now, I'm not about to tell you, you know, that you got to do it, and it's legalism or anything like that. But I think you'll see the beauty, the invitation of what I have to share to you, and how sensible it is. All right, so we're praying through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. That's where we are today. Give us this, this day our daily bread. And this is the first in series in our year-long theme about spiritual formation. 
If we were doing yoga classes and Tai Chi and kickboxing and weightlifting, we would be working on physical formation, right? And some people are bodybuilders and they've got massive muscles. And, they, and some people are ballet dancers and they've got an amazing, you know, control of their body. They've, you know, done tremendous work with their physical formation. You and I have the opportunity to be formed spiritually, internally, in a place that eyes can't see and in a uh, part of us that is not dependent on our physical health or strength internal formation, creating a beautiful sanctuary for the Lord, like the sanctuary that we worshiped in for the National Gathering, a beautiful space for relationship with God. We're being formed spiritually. We're being invited to greater spiritual formation this year. All right, so the Lord teaches us to pray and says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, at first glance, it seems pretty clear that the Lord is teaching us to pray for stuff that we physically need. We're creatures. Here's, here's, this, is, this is great. This will give you something to really meditate on this Sunday that you can really take home. All right, ready for this? Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. All right, so you, we're creatures. Wherever we go, there we are. You know, we've, we're living in our bodies, and we get hungry, we get tired, we get happy, we get sad. These little... Uh, organs in our body, these glands pump out hormones that make us sad, happy, agitated, grow tall, not grow tall, uh, age in a certain way, don't age in a certain way, like they affect us. And, and eventually our bodies said, I've had enough, you know, time to go to heaven. But in the meantime, here we are, we're creatures living in these bodies and we need stuff. We have some basic earthly natural needs that jesus says it's okay to ask for bread is something that symbolizes the most basic human need your little cells your little lungs and heart they're not going to work without the energy that comes from calories that little grain of wheat that grew in the ground it got energy from the sun that big blazing sun that actually appeared the other day and, uh, and all that energy, that heat went into that plant and it made that little kernel of wheat and then you ate it. And you had that energy, energy in your body. And that's why you can keep your eyes open through this whole sermon today. Thank you. Just, you know, if somebody's losing it, just do this. Okay. Jesus knows you need that. You're a creature. You're a creature. And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. You're going to taste bread in the cup. You'll feel it go inside your body. And you're going to know that the Lord's presence is with you. You're creatures. You need the kind of help that God gives. So it's okay. Bread says you can pray for what you need. But Jesus could have used any number of words or phrases to invite you to pray for the things you need as a creature, as an as a animal, as a you know, human being. He could have said, meet our earthly needs. He could have said that. He said, could have said, take care of us in this world. He could have said that. But he said something that cannot be ignored for any good Hebrew disciple, like the disciples who asked him how to pray. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Now, he said day and daily twice. You know, the, referred to day two times. And that means emphasis in Hebrew thinking. Look, read the book of Psalms and see how many times it gives a parallel. It says one thing and it says it just a little bit differently right afterwards. Emphasis, beauty, uh, please pay attention to this. Please see this day and daily. And bread. It wasn't day, give us this day our daily material needs or whatever. But he said bread. If you're a Hebrew like the disciples and you're hearing a teacher, a rabbi, teach and rabbis teach in parables you know jesus is teaching in parables he's always leading them to think and say what's the meaning behind the meaning and you hear him say daily bread there's one thing your mind's going to go to just like that can you think of it Do you know what the daily bread is yeah it's the bread that came down from heaven and fed the israelites in the desert for 40 years you ever watch uh, man versus wild i guess it's an old show now uh, I, I always love the nature shows and the survival shows. It's this guy that gets dropped in the jungle and in the Siberian winter and all these places that are hard to survive, and he's just got nothing but a pair of tweezers and a pocket knife, and he's going to make it, you know? So once he gets dropped in the Mexican desert, 
And I can tell you that was hard to watch. It is not easy to survive in the desert. Now try having a whole group, little kids and old nanas and bapas and everybody, millions in the desert, and try surviving. It's a miracle. God miraculously gave them angels' food in the desert, manna, bread from heaven. And what happened is it covered the rocks like frost. And then when the sun came up, it melted it, and poof, it was gone. So it was, it was daily bread. It was bread from heaven, and it was a gift that they had to gather. They had to gather it before the sun hit it. Now, if they thought that they would be clever and gather so much manna that they'd only have to gather it once and be fed for a week, they would gather up a big stack and they'd laugh at their neighbors, I got all this manna and you just got a little bit. You're going to be coming to me and selling your shoes to me so you can get some of my manna. Ha, ha, ha. Well, what would happen is a day later, it would be stinky and filled with worms. It was only good for one day. It was daily bread. You better get out there and gather it first thing in the morning. Top priority. You want it? It's going to be gone. So go get it. It's a priority. It's from heaven. And it's daily. There was one exception to the daily bread, and that was the day before the Sabbath. You could get two days' worth, so you could rest on the Sabbath. Now, I'm just going to throw this in here re real quick. I'm going to shamelessly talk about my own secret prayer life that I'm supposed to keep a secret. I'm going to lose all my reward in heaven and just blow it on my ego, and somebody will have to humiliate me to get me back down to normal, but I'm going to talk about my own prayer life right here. I take Sundays off. Woo! I didn't pray this morning. I'm counting on you. Yeah, it's true. I didn't pray till I got to church and prayed with you. I get up and get over here, and I got to be up and making stuff happen by 7 o'clock, and I just I didn't do it because I never do on Sunday. I take a break. But every other day, it's a priority for me, and I got to do it before the sun gets hot, which I got all day here. <laughs> but, you know... I got to do it before I get into the dishes and into calling that person back and moving the firewood and doing the laundry, showing up at work for crying out loud, you know, all this stuff. It's a priority. I've got to do it or I'm going to lose it. Now, in a January uh, college class in college back in at Tall Timber Ranch in the North Cascades in Washington, I was with the great professor and author and speaker, Jerry Sitzer. He wrote what I think is the most wonderful book about grief that you could ever read. Because he went through a really severe grief. Right before I appeared on campus and got to know him, and was able to take his classes, he was struck by a drunk driver, and in front of his eyes, he lost his mom, his daughter, and his wife. He's trying to resuscitate them, and people were standing around. He was asking for help, and they just stood shell-shocked. And two weeks later, he had to teach class. And he's teaching about spirituality, and teaching about the Bible, teaching about God. And for months, he couldn't pray. He couldn't sing. But he believed. And rather than hardening his heart and saying, I'm not going to hurt anymore, he said, I'm going to hurt and hurt and hurt, but my soul will be expanded because of it, and there'll be more space for God. And in that season, he drew near to the Lord in a way that you can only do in a time of trauma and grief. And so when he said to us in that class at that Christian camp in the mountains in the snow in January, he said to us, yesterday's faith is no good for today. He had the authority to say that to us. He was a man who had lived and survived because of the faith he had during his crisis. And then he was tempted to coast and say, whew, that was a lot of work. Now I can just rest. Boy, I sure was holy. I needed to be. Now I can just rest. He says, no, you can't. You need the Lord every day. It's daily bread. Daily. I listened to a rabbi talk about this daily bread because I figured... They're good at the Old Testament. You ought to know something about it. And he talked about how the Lord kept the children of Israel on a starvation diet. Do you know how you would feel if you ate Nilla wafers, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 40 years? 
what's for dinner? Mm, I don't know. It tastes like honey. <laughs> it tastes like bread cooked with oil. There's not much to it, but it'll be warm this time. I'm going to heat it up for something different. Prayer is like that. If you want to make prayer a priority and get to it before the sun gets hot and you expect it to be a thrill ride, you expect it to be entertaining, you're in for a disappointment. Prayer is like manna. It's daily bread. You have to get after it like it's a priority, like you'll die without it. You have to get after it like it's the thing you need. But when you get after it, it's going to be boring. <laughs> it's going to be boring. It's going to be a chore. That's why you get to rest on Sunday. It's a chore. But Jesus is teaching you to get after it, and he's teaching you how. When he's saying, give us this day our daily bread, he's not just saying that you can pray for the shoes on your feet and the roof over your head and the food you're going to eat today. He's saying that you can pray every day, even though it's boring. You can get after it like you have to, like your life depends on it. And the, the beautiful third message in this is that the, the, the thing that your life depends on is not just prayer, but Jesus. The thing that you have to gather up every day that'll rot if you just try to coast and let yesterday's gathering be good enough is Jesus. It's not just a discipline. It's not just words. It's Jesus himself. Check this out. So, John chapter 6, Jesus feeds a crowd of 5,000. And then there's some people negotiating with him because they know he's presenting himself as the Messiah and they say, um, so uh, what sign will you give us to show us you're the one? Uh, Moses gave us bread every day in the desert. Think of the savings, no food expenses, you know. All we got to do is just talk this Messiah guy into feeding us, giving us bread every day. He'll prove he's the Messiah. We get free bread. What a deal. Jesus said, no, 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 no. What you really need is the bread that comes from heaven, the true bread that comes from heaven. Moses didn't give you that stuff anyway. It came from God. And you know the true bread that comes from God? From heaven? That's me. Jesus is the true bread that comes from heaven. What you need every day that yesterday's faith isn't good enough for, yesterday's experience with won't feed you today. What you need every day is Jesus himself. You need the Lord. When I was a college student, uh, my best friend and I started in the same college and went different ways. He went to a Bible college in Eugene. It's my buddy Aaron who was here a couple times. He's going to come again. He's like a bad penny. He keeps showing up. He keeps turning up. He's like a bad penny. Okay, so anyway, my buddy Aaron, truly a treasure to me. We were in college. I went and visited him in his Bible college. It was all holy. My college wasn't quite so holy. His college was all holy. We were talking about our faith in God. I said, you know, sometimes I pray on Tuesday afternoon. I was talking about my prayer life. He said, Dana, you got to pray in the morning every day. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, you might think, well, go ahead, prove it to me from the Bible. They got to pray in the morning every day and have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's nonsense. It didn't hit me like nonsense. It just hit me like, oh, like the way the basketball hoop conversation hit me. Like, oh, wow, I want to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I guess I will pray every day in the morning. That's how it started for me. I just did it. He influenced me, and I just did it. A personal relationship with Jesus, he said. It, like, echoed in my heart and mind. Yeah, that's what I want. And that's what Jesus is offering us when he says, give us this day our daily bread. Not only can you pray for your money. I do. Hallelujah. I like, Lord Jesus, uh, I haven't been real smart in the first 50 years, you know, but um, I trust you. Help. And, and what gives me hope is I pray, help me be a good steward. Because I know that's what the Lord will, will bless. And I pray for my car and my appliances. And, you know, I pray for all this mundane stuff. And you're invited to. But I also know that Jesus is teaching me to seek him like that manna, that bread from heaven. And it's really him. It's really him that's going to satisfy me. So here we go. When Luke, in, in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus teaches about the Lord's Prayer, immediately following... Luke says, you know, you lame old dads, moms, you know, you wicked dads. If your kids ask for a, a fish, you won't give them a snake. And if they ask for an egg, you won't give them a scorpion. Like you guys aren't even that great. And when you 
uh, you know, when you get asked as a father, as a parent, from a kid, you know, your own kid, hey, can I have something that I need? You give them the right thing. And Jesus said, won't God give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him? And here it is. He's bringing, starts with, an, uh, uh, you know, a fish or an egg, something that you need, the calories you need to burn. And it ends up with the presence of God. Man, this whole Bible is about the presence of God. God with people in the garden. God with people in the restored Eden uh, at the end of the book in Revelation with the river and the trees. And God leading them through the wilderness with the pillar of fire. God with the pillar of fire, tongues of fire over their heads when the Holy Spirit comes. The presence of God, that is it. That's what you need every day. So I hope that I influence you. You know, you're, you're not going to be a naughty Christian or a bad person if you don't immediately, um, you know, uh, have better than any monk kind of prayer earlier in the morning. But here it is. It's a gift. Gather this gift up. This is, uh, you know, what the Lord's offering us. And, and now as we come to the Lord's table, we're going to taste and see that the Lord is good. So please join me. This is the table for all of God's people. Everyone who comes to Christ through faith. Jesus is the door. He's the way. He's the good shepherd. He's the way to the Father.